welcome to our today presentation and uh, I thank the Lord for uh, his uh, continued providence in our lives and uh, I welcome you to the viewing and the listening of number 12 in our series of the tabernacles and uh, today we are going to look at uh, the issue of let us keep the feast, let us keep the feast. And so I pray that uh, the Lord will bless us as we share in this uh, presentation. And so shall we give thanks as we go ahead uh, in looking at what the Lord has for us. Our Heavenly Father, glory and honor be unto thy name. Once again, we come before your presence. We know that uh, without you, we can do nothing. And so we pray that uh, you may minister unto us. Your holy angels may keep uh, at bay the evil angels, and we may have a holy atmosphere to be able to disseminate your word, uh, dividing the word of truth without shame. And so thank you for accepting our prayers in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. So um, this is uh, one of those sessions. Uh, I'm not doing this per se so that... Uh, uh, maybe somebody may uh, bring a review about it or um, striving with anyone on this. But uh, I just want to present it as uh, I see it plainly in the Bible and also in the spirit of prophecy and uh, in various commentaries so that uh, we may understand what uh, does it mean that let us keep the feast. And, uh, the feast. and so, um, the verse that uh, we are looking at is um, this is uh, exploring First Corinthians chapter five, verses seven and verses eight. And uh, uh, you see, people uh, before I, I just read this, people read in the book of Acts and they say Peter uh, Paul was able to attend the, the feast of the Passover, the feast of unleavened bread, and the other feasts that uh, uh, the Jewish people used to, uh, to have. And so Paul was a feast keeper, and uh, the early apostles were feast keepers. But uh, let us look at what uh, the Bible says and what the inspiration wants to tell us about this issue that uh, uh, let us keep the feast. Uh, I believe that. Uh, Jesus says that uh, if you follow after me, uh, you shall know of my doctrine, and that is all we want to know. And so in the book of uh, First Corinthians, chapter 5, verses 7 and 8, we read, uh, Purge out therefore the old living, that, uh, that uh, he may be a new lamb as he are unliving. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with all living, neither with the living of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of uh, sincerity and truth. And so people read this, and they read what is in the book of uh, uh, Acts, and they said, you see, Paul kept the feast, and also we have to keep the feast if God did not rebuke him. So... There's no problem with the keeping the peace, but um, uh, let us uh, look at some evidence and um, let us see what Paul is speaking to us. Let us see what um, Paul is um, really uh, speaking to us. In saying, therefore, let us keep the peace not with all living, neither with the living of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Uh, this has been uh, a verse which has uh, uh, been read disjointedly of this meaning of what Paul wants us to put across in the whole chapter, extending to chapter 11 before he comes to the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the early church faced a lot of problems with Gentiles who didn't want to relinquish their superstitions and Jews who prided themselves in their ceremonies. In fact, when you go to Galatians chapter Three, he asked the Galatians, uh, who has bewitched them that after starting in faith, they want to end in the law. They want to end it in the law. And so the Jewish were, who prided themselves in their ceremonies were not uh, ready to uh, uh, relinquish their sacrificial system. 
a judicial reading will start at verse eight, but verse one and extend to chapter 11, last verse of the same book. There was lot, a lot of uh, fractions in the Corinthian church and many men not of the holy institution that Jesus had left to his disciples. And so the most um, debasing licentiousness that never even happens among the heathen were being reported of the church. And instead of purging the living among them, the Corinthian church was boasting about it. You can read that in First Corinthians chapter 5, where uh, actually a man goes and lays with uh, his mother and instead of the church doing something, they were, they were just there seated and doing nothing. So these open sins were even being carried to the Lord's Supper. And you can check that in First Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23. He asked them, when you come together, don't you have homes whereby you can eat uh, your meal, whereby you can eat your meal? Do you have to come and profane the place of worship? No respect was being shown to it, and instead of being made uh, of uh, being taken in awe and solemnity, it was being dealt with like a common meal and with many differences and malice taking place. This um, made uh, Paul write to them that uh, they ought to keep the feast, not with the old living, but uh, they should be purged of uh, their old living, which is uh, malice and so on. And so, uh, Paul continued to admonish the church. And uh, uh, if uh, you look in various commentaries on the book of 1 Corinthians, uh, that is uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 7 and 8, like uh, when you look at uh, Albert uh, uh, Barnes' uh, New Testament commentary, and this is one of the commentaries that uh, Sister White used to have in her library, and also the Adam Clark commentary. The pioneers used to use a lot of uh, uh, these commentaries. And so I'd like you to see what uh, we find in that commentary on the book of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. We are told that, uh, let us keep the feast in the margin, a holy day, eto zomen. This is a language drawn from the Paschal feast and is used by Paul frequently to carry out and apply his illustration. It does not mean literally the Paschal Supper here, for that had ceased to be observed by Christians, nor the Lord's Supper particularly, but the same is that the Jewish, when they celebrated the Paschal Supper and the slaying and sacrifice of the Paschal Lamb, put away all living as emblematic of sin. So let us in the slaying of our sacrifice and in all the duties, uh, institutions and event consequent thereon, put away all wickedness from our hearts, as individuals and from our societies and churches, let us engage in the service of God by putting away all evil. This is the thought that Paul is trying to convey in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 and 8. He is not saying that now we have the appointed times, that uh, now the typical feasts have to be kept by the Christians, but many people have blown out uh, the verse to mean that uh, we have to keep the feast. And so, uh, Further on, if you go just to the book of Romans, chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, uh, Paul talking about keeping the feast with uh, uh, unleavened or malice. He says that, uh, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Does this mean that um, we have to go to the temple and be sacrificed and all that stuff? He says that uh, we should present ourselves holy unto the Lord, uh, our bodies as a living sacrifice, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but ye be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of uh, God. And uh, one of the things that uh, I have found in my studies is that uh, no feast overlapped another feast. Like uh, you could not celebrate the feast of uh, the first fruit on the uh, time that you are uh, celebrating the, the Passover. So the, there is no way on the day of atonement you can bring in the other feasts to be kept in parallel. I mean, um, that uh, you are celebrating the, pa the, the Passover and then you are in the day of atonement celebrating it. You, you don't find such a kind of a scenario in the Bible uh, 
the only thing that uh, maybe you find in the book of John that happened, there was times when the normal Sabbath fell on the feast and it was called a, a high Sabbath. But to find that um, there was uh, the last supper running in parallel with the first fruit or running in parallel with the trumpets or running in parallel with the day of atonement or the tabernacles. It is something that was not there in the, in the sanctuary service. So today, if somebody tells us that we have to keep the feast, this is, these are some of the questions that we have to ask ourselves. Really, even in the Old Testament, was there any time that um, the festival, uh, 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 um, uh, the festival uh, institutions there that God gave them used to run in parallel? And uh, you, you can only find that in the New Testament where people say that now, we can also keep the Passover as a feast. We can do the unleavened bread and we can do this and this, yet we are in the day of atonement. Now, in now, uh, why, why did Paul attend the feasts while Christ had died and uh, the sacrificial system had been done away with? In the life of Paul, page 160, life of Paul, page 160, paragraph two, uh, life of Paul, page uh, 160, paragraph two. This is um, what uh, we find. We read that uh, when working for the unconverted Jews, he did not once begin to preach that which they regarded as dangerous heresy, but commenced with doctrines upon which they could agree. Beginning with Moses and the prophets, he led them gradually from point to point, comparing scripture with scripture, tracing down the fulfillment of prophecy, showing the evidence that the Messiah was to have come and the manner of his coming. He then clearly presented before them the object of his coming and what he was to have done upon the earth and how he was to have uh, been received. And so, uh, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 19 to 23, Paul, continuing in this theme, um, says that, For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And unto the Jewish, I became a, as a Jew, that I might gain the Jewish. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. So Paul is not living a life as a Jew per se. He is not living a life as a person who is under the law but uh, he is living a life so that if he could gain more to Christ, well and good. But to say that now Paul was a feast keeper or uh, Paul now was a Gentile in one way or another, or he was under the law, actually it is um, to, uh, to, to ignore a lot of scriptures which say that uh, uh, the only Jew is a Jew who is uh, a Jew in the heart and not a Jew by flesh. And so you cannot uh, lamb Paul in the Jew uh, accordance to the lineage, but Paul is a Jew according to the Jew who is converted uh, in heart, uh, according to Romans chapter 12. And so he says that uh, unto the Jew, I became a Jew, unto the Gentile, I became a Gentile, unto those under the law, I became like those who are under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law, to them are that are without the law as without the law. So if we have to be consistent enough, then we have, if we say that Paul kept the feast and so he was a feast keeper, then we have to say that Paul was lawless because he was to them without law as a one who is without the law. So let us not just stop at Paul was a feast keeper. Let us say that Paul was a lawless person also because that is what the verse uh, tells us. And so being not without the law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without the law. To the weak, I became as one weak. So we cannot also say that Paul was weak because he says that uh, in his all afflictions, he besought the Lord and the Lord said that his strength is sufficient for him. So Paul was strong in Christ. And uh, to the weak I became as weak that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake that I might be a partaker thereof with you. And so... The only sufficient reason I find for Paul attending the feast in Jerusalem is to have um, a point in which he uh, 
he can be able to reach to the Jewish who are not ready to relinquish keeping the feast. Like uh, today, even you can decide to go to a Sunday church and sit there and have a service with them. But for what reason? Have you become a Sunday keeper? No, you have not become a Sunday keeper, but you have gone there so that peradventure, if there is a chance for you to be able to minister to one who doesn't know the truth, you may get that chance. So you have become everything to everyone so that you may uh, be able to meet other people. And so I, I believe that um, this is what the Lord is telling unto uh, us why Paul was able to keep the feast. If uh, you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 32 and 33, Paul says, give none offense, neither to the Jewish, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God, even as I please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that uh, they may be saved. And so uh, you, you continue getting this idea that uh, Paul uh, was uh, among the Jewish, not as a Jew uh, in, the, in, the, in the strictest sense, but a Jew in a, a way that uh, uh, he may be able to have a common ground, then expound the scripture slowly to them until they come to a point of understanding the mission of Jesus Christ, his fulfillments of the types, and uh, him being the anti-type of those types, and what was done away with and what was not uh, done away with. So Paul says that let us keep the feast. And how should we keep this feast? A feast with sincerity and truth and with unleavened bread of malice and wickedness. So the unleavened bread to keep that feast that Paul is saying is the unleavened bread of doing away with malice and wickedness and having sincerity and truth in our hearts. It doesn't sound like a, a normal feast where there's an appointed time. And even if you say that uh, we don't have a lamb to sacrifice, but this is the appointed time, okay with you. But uh, that is not the idea that Paul is having in this verse. He's talking about malice and wickedness, not uh, the actual feast that uh, was keeping. Uh, was kept in a typical way or uh, trying to do it to be able to come to an typical way of doing things. And so uh, the idea of Paul is that um, our whole life should be, uh, 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 should be put away. Remember 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, we are told if anyone, if any man be in Christ, he has become a new creature. Behold, the old is gone, the new has come. So the keeping of the feast or, um, and uh, this idea just comes into my mind that uh, Christ was the unleavened bread, in which way sin was not found in him. So for us to really show the world that we recognize that Christ is the unleavened bread and he fulfilled the unleavened bread feast, our lives must be purged, purged of the old life and the new life be in us, even the life of Christ who went about and never sinned. And so this is the idea now I get that um, if we will tell the world that uh, Christ was the antitypical unleavened bread, and he fulfilled that feast. The way, the best way to show the people is not even to preach about it. Preaching about it is good, but showing it in our lives that uh, really we have the spirit of Christ, which doesn't have living in it, which means darkness or sin. The old life and the new should not run parallel with one another so that you can pass from one uh, to other. They are not side by side but end to end, the one all preceding the other, the one seizing and terminating where the other begins. And so in Jesus fulfilling the feast of the unleavened bread, it shows us that we pass from the old life of sin into the new um, uh, life of holiness. Think about this. After Christ fulfilling the feast of unleavened bread, he died and went uh, and was buried. Uh, I mean, uh, he, he, he lay in the grave as uh, unleavened bread, the bread without sin. And because he did not have sin, the father was able to call him from the grave. And by his glory, 
he resurrected him. By his spirit, he was able to resurrect him, which means that the one who lay in the grave as uh, um, a fulfillment of uh, the typical service, anti-typical service of a living bread, death could not hold him down because he was sinless. And that, that is what it means to uh, keep the feast without uh, the, the living. And uh, the purpose of uh, the sanctuary feasts were to show um, how Christ had uh, reconciled humanity to himself. At every advance of step in the, in the sanctuary, it was Christ fulfilling um, the, the feast to show us that uh, uh, he was uh, reconciling us back to his father. He was reconciling us back to his um, father. In, um, in uh, Patriarchs and Prophets, uh, I'd like us to read something in Patriarchs and Prophets, page uh, 593, para, five, 539, paragraph, uh, paragraph uh, 3. Patriarchs and Prophets, page uh, 539, paragraph 3. Should we keep the feast days does the shadow supersede the reality? That is our question because some people have said that, oh, now we have to keep the appointed times, we have to keep the feast. And uh, this is not to go at our brethren and uh, maybe uh, say a word to condemn them, no. Let everyone stand in the side of Christ the way he will want to stand. I'm presenting at the standpoint that I'm seeing it. In 539.3 of Patriarchs and Prophets, on the 14th day of the month at even, the Passover was celebrated its solemn impressive ceremonies commemorating the deliverance from the bondage in Egypt and pointing forward to the sacrifice that should deliver from the bondage of sin. When the Savior yielded up his life on Calvary, the significance of the Passover season. Now, you can read such a word and then say that we have to keep the Passover when the prophet says that the significance of the Passover season and the ordinance of the Lord's Supper was instituted as a memorial of the same event which the Passover had been attacked. Now, so if you want to celebrate the Passover in a better way, then keep the Lord's Supper. That, that is what I find from, uh, I try to understand from the, uh, the Patriarchs and Prophet uh, 539.3, that uh, the Passover ceased and in it is placed, this is a new ordinance. This is not even an anti-type to Passover. This is a whole new institution being given as a memorial to the uh, Church of God. And uh, in Review and Herald, October 10, 1899, paragraph 9, we read, the Jewish ceremonial law has passed away. The temple is in ruins. Jerusalem was given up to be destroyed, but the law of the Ten Commandments lives and will live through the eternal ages. The need for the service of sacrifices and offerings ceased when type met anti-type in the death of Christ. In him, the shadow reached the substance. The Lamb of God was a complete and perfect offering. Types and shadows, offerings and sacrifices had no virtue after Christ's death on the cross, but God's law was not crucified with the Savior. Had it been, Satan would have gained all that he attempted to gain in heaven. For this attempt, he was expelled from heavenly courts, and today he is deceiving human beings in regard to the law of God. But this law will maintain it is exalted character as long as the throne of Jehovah endures. Christ came to live this law and he declares, I have kept my father's commandment. And so we find that uh, the Jewish ceremonial law has passed away and none need to keep it. And uh, what does this mean that um, uh, uh, sin should not be found in us? You know, the... The sanctuary is uh, a compacted prophecy and the gospel is the sanctuary unfolded. And so uh, uh, you find a clash between these two things, but not per se a clash, but um, a harmony of uh, what the sanctuary pointed to and what the gospel is telling us. And so Christ came and lived through these feasts. Christ came and lived through this life that uh, humanity had to live. Uh, and uh, now man has been reconciled uh, even to God. And uh, in Christ, he can be able to keep his law perfectly. And so what was the problem in, uh, 
the church in Corinth, the church in Galatia, the church in Ephesus, and uh, even uh, you find many churches that they have this problem where the Jews were creeping in and telling them that if one doesn't do this and do that, then they cannot be uh, 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 the children of God. What was the problem? In Acts of Apostles, page 383, paragraph 1, Acts of Apostles, Acts of Apostles, uh, this is page uh, 383, paragraph 1. We read, the false teachers were mingling Jewish traditions with the truth of the gospel. Ignoring the decision of the general council at Jerusalem, they urged the Gentile converts the observance of ceremonial law. And uh, you find that the people are saying that uh, we have to go back to keeping the feast, we have to go back to uh, having appointed times in the sanctuary. I, I don't know how we can reconcile this, but uh, it seems it's never possible because this was the same problem that uh, the church was facing, uh, that the Gentiles may be able to keep the uh, observant of the ceremonial law, but uh, we find that uh, this was not the case. What did Paul do when uh, they urged him that the Gentiles must keep this ceremonial law? In 3SP, that is Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 3, page 411, paragraph 1, we read, Paul did not bind himself nor his converts to the ceremonies and customs of the Jews with their varied forms, types, and sacrifices. Now, types, there's nothing else in the types than the seven feasts of the sanctuary. And uh, for he recognized that the perfect and final offering had been made in the death of the Son of God. The age of clearer light and knowledge had now come. And although the early education of Paul had blinded his eyes to this light and led him to bitterly oppose the work of God, yet the revelation of Christ to him while on his way to Damascus had changed the whole current of his life. His character and works had now become a remarkable illustration of those of his divine Lord. His teaching led the mind to a more active spiritual life that carried the believer above mere ceremonies. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are broken heart, a broken and a contrite heart of God thou will not uh, despise. Uh, Paul continues to say, the Jewish had always prided themselves upon their divinely appointed services. And so you see the appointed times, we have the types and we have the sacrifices, and we are being told they had prided themselves upon their divinely appointed services. And many of those who had been converted to the faith of Christ still felt that since God had once clearly outlined the Hebrew manner of worship, it was improbable that uh, he would ever authorize a change of any of its specifications. So they thought that even with Christ's death, not a single specification had to change. But Paul continues to say in AA 189.3, they insisted that the Jewish laws and ceremonies should be incorporated in the rites of Christian religion. They were slow to discern that all the sacrificial Offerings had but prefigured the death of the Son of God in which type met anti-type, and after which the rites and ceremonies of the mosaic dispensation were no longer binding. And so um, maybe we can say that uh, uh, some of the brethren are slow to transit from uh, the Jewish ceremonial and sacrificial system to the to the to the gospel dispensation where actually Christ is our Passover lamb and Christ is uh, the fulfillment of this feast. And so uh, Paul was trying to attend their services so that uh, he may be able to teach them some of the things that um, uh, were still wanting in their, uh, in their worship. Now, the sketches from the life of Paul, page 64 and 65, uh, let me blow this so that uh, we may be able to read together. Uh, this is uh, 
the sketches from the life of Paul, page 64 and 65. The Jewish were not generally prepared to move as fast as the problem of God opened the way. It was evident to them from the result of the apostle labors among the Gentiles that the converts among the latter would far exceed the Jewish converts. And that if the restrictions and ceremonies of the Jewish law are not made obligatory upon their accepting the faith of Christ, the national peculiarities of the Jewish, which kept them distinct from all other people, will finally disappear from among those who embrace the gospel truth. So they were jealousy that um, if the Gentiles came in and they did not keep the feast, then uh, their religion could have no place on the face of the earth. And th this was unfounded uh, jealous that had nothing to do with the gospel of Christ because the gospel of Christ uh, is to fish in as many as he can and uh, give them a character that is fit for heaven. But the Jewish wanted always to keep this distinct peculiarity and uh, walls of partition. So the Jewish uh, had uh, prided themselves upon the divinely appointed services and they concluded that as God once specified the Hebrew man of worship, it was impossible that he should ever authorize a change in any of its specifications. They decided that Christianity must connect itself with the Jewish laws and ceremonies. They were slow to discern to the end of that which had been abolished by the death of Christ and to perceive that all their sacrificial offerings had but prefigured the death of the Son of God in which type had met it is anti-type rendering valueless the divinely appointed ceremonies and sacrifices of the Jewish religion. Paul had prided himself upon his pharisaical strictness, but after the revelation of Christ to him on the road to Damascus, the mission of the Savior and his own work in the conversion of the Gentiles were plain to his mind, and he fully comprehended the difference between a living faith and a dead formalism. Paul still claimed to be one of the children of Abraham and kept the Ten Commandments in letter and in spirit as faithfully as he had ever done before his, Christ, his conversion to Christianity. But he knew that the typical ceremonies must soon altogether cease. So to start arguing that Paul kept the feast and he was a feast keeper, when inspiration says that Paul knew that the typical ceremonies must soon altogether pass, it is really something that cannot be reconciled. To my case, it can be reconciled. I don't know uh, if to you it can be reconciled. Seeing that which they had shadowed forth had come to pass, and uh, the light of the gospel was shedding its glory upon the Jewish religion, giving a new significance to its ancient rites. That is sketches from the life of Paul, page 64 uh, and uh, 65. And so we continue studying this thing, let us keep the feast. And uh, when we say let us keep the feast, what kind of feast are we talking about? What kind of feast are we talking about? The feast of um, having the unleavened bread in our life, Christ formed within the hope of glory, which is the putting away of sin. That is the only way you can really put a better emphasis on Christ fulfilled was the typical fulfillment of uh, the Jewish feast. As um, we enter into the last segments, in, uh, in uh, one SM, that is Selected Messages, book one, page uh, 237 to 239, I'll read some extract, not everything that is there, again, so that we may see what inspiration talks about. The types, and shadows of the sacrificial service with the prophecies gave the Israelites a veiled in distinct view of the mercy and grace to be brought to the world by the revelation of Christ. To Moses was unfolded the significance of the types and shadows pointed to Christ. He saw to the end of that which was to be done away when at the death of Christ, type met anti-type. He saw that only through Christ can men keep the moral law. By transgression of this law, man can, by transgression of this law, man brought sin into the world. And with sin came what? It came death. By sin came death. Christ became the propitiation for man's sin. 
he proffered his perfection of character in the place of man's sinfulness. He took upon himself the curse of disobedience. The sacrifices and offerings pointed forward to the sacrifice he was to make. The slain lamb typified the lamb that was to take away the sin of the world. After Christ died on the cross as a sin offering, the ceremonial law would have no force. Yet it was connected with the moral law and was glorious. The whole bore the stamp of divinity and expressed the holiness, justice, righteousness of God. <laughs> and if the ministration of the dispensation to be done away was, away was glorious, how much more must the reality be glorious when Christ was revealed, giving his life-giving sanctifying spirit to all who believe? The Jews refuse to accept Christ as the Messiah, and they cannot see that their ceremonies are meaningless, that the sacrifices and offerings have lost their significance. The veil drawn by themselves in stubborn unbelief is still before their minds. It will be removed if they will accept Christ, the righteousness of the law. And so this is um, what people are really struggling with, uh, that um, uh, they may be able to come out of uh, these ceremonies and uh, offer the life, their lives as a living sacrifice unto the Lord. Mm -hmm. And so with uh, such an overwhelming evidence, how can one think of the feast live alone their appointed time? It is very clear that uh, the festivals were given especially for the offerings and sacrifices. When um, you read Leviticus 23, 37, we are told that uh, these are the feast of the Lord, which we shall proclaim to be holy convocations to offer an offering. So the holy convocations, they were meant for an offering to be offered. So if there is no offering, there is no holy convocations per se. And so Christ has become our, 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 our fulfillment of the types. And so... We are told that these are the Lord's appointed feasts, which we are to proclaim as sacred assemblies for bringing offerings made by fire to the Lord in Leviticus 23, 37. In the basic Bible English, we are told these are fixed feasts of the Lord to be kept by you as holy days of worship for making an offering by fire to the Lord. So if you read in uh, various Bibles about Leviticus 23, verse 37, you find that... Um, the sacrifices cannot be separated from the times and the offerings. And if you want to do one thing, then do it all the way because they are intrinsically inseparable. And so um, I hope that is not harsh, but uh, it seems the reality of the matter. If you read the New Living Translation about Leviticus 23, 37, it says, these are the Lord's appointed festivals celebrate them each year as official days for whole assembly by presenting special gifts to the Lord. In various rendering, you will find that uh, these things were there for to bring an offering to the Lord. And so um, in Galatians chapter 3, uh, I talked about Galatians chapter 3, Paul laments to the Galatian church and uh, there are people who are creeping into the church. And Paul, like the apostle who had been with Jesus for three years, had to sit under the tutorship of Jesus in the desert of Arabia for three years to be able to learn about these feasts and uh, what was their fulfillment and what was expected of the Christian church and what was not expected of it. Um, we should not be just satisfied uh, with uh, a formal religion and uh, we should be willing to see Christ leading us in uh, our daily lives. His main purpose is what is found in Genesis chapter two, chapter 1 verses 26 and uh, God created man in his own likeness and in his own image. And that is, has been the struggle. That is the burden of every scripture that the Lord may um, restore man to the image of Christ, uh, of God, that was uh, obliterated or effaced by sin. And so to be in Christ is something more important than uh, just hanging on uh, a formal religion where um, you want to do this and uh, you want to do that. But actually, as the Jewish people are, uh, uh, 
really prided themselves in knowing the scriptures, in uh, following after this feast. And uh, they came a point that uh, they crucified the one who was the antitypical, uh, 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 um, the antitype of the feast of the sanctuary. And so the, there is a good, uh, a good beginning and a sad ending. We, in Galatians chapter three, they are starting with the spirit. They are enjoying the spirit through faith. They are enjoying spiritual privileges and the spiritual gifts. They are having spiritual victory over spiritual powers. They are discharging spiritual duties and they are exercising the hopes of perfection in heaven. But now comes intruders and uh, what do they bring about? In Galatians chapter 4, verse 9, they bring about beggarly elements. In Galatians 5, 19, they bring about the works of flesh. And um, again, in the same Galatians, they bring about the works of the law, being made perfect by the works of the law. And so Paul tells them in Philippians chapter 3, verses 9, that uh, he is striving that at the end he may be found with the righteousness of God, which is by faith in Christ, which is not the righteousness by the law and uh, this feast that uh, they were saying that uh, Christ had not done away with. Now, let us uh, try to reason out the everlasting covenant. What is it made of? In Hebrews chapter 8 and uh, verses 10, we previously found out that God said he will write his laws on our hearts. The old covenant in Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 13, he made a covenant with them. And that covenant, he wrote the laws on the tables of the stone. That is the old covenant. But in the new covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, he writes the law in our hearts. Now, Abraham was not a, a feast keeper. You, you, you won't really go into the issue that Abraham was a, keep, uh, a feast uh, keeper. There are some uh, there are some uh, story where we are told that uh, Abraham made a feast for his son Isaac. And so they say, look, Abraham <coughs> was able to celebrate the feast. But uh, if you read the scripture carefully, the old covenant or the Abrahamic covenant was uh, not about uh, keeping the feast. The Lord made a covenant with Abraham and he told him that uh, he will be his child. And uh, Abraham is the father of faith. And we don't find that uh, with the covenant that uh, God made him with him, it was a covenant of keeping the feast. And so if we say that, um, we are Abraham's children. Abraham himself never kept the feast. Where we, we get the issue of faith and keeping of the feast. Now, am I saying that um, the old covenant with it is sacrificial system have nothing to the people in the Christian dispensation? That is not what I'm saying per se. There are a lot of lessons to be learned in the sacrificial system. In fact, without the sacrificial system, you cannot know that Christ is the antitype. It is from this uh, feasts and the Old Testament sacrificial system that we get the great lessons of uh, the plan of uh, redemption. And so, um, just looking at the last points, uh, our life, what is much important in our life? Looking at this uh, last point, what um, Christ would want to tell us. In AA 383, AA, that is Acts of Apostles, page 383, we read this. While tarrying at Corinth, Paul had cause for serious apprehension concerning some of the churches already established. 
through the influence of false teachers who had arisen among the believers in Jerusalem, division, heresy, and uh, sensualism were rapidly gaining ground among the believers in Galatia. These uh, false teachers were mingling Jewish traditions with the truth of the gospel, ignoring the decision of the general council at Jerusalem. They urged upon the Gentiles converts the observance of ceremonial law. Now, Paul says, um, and this is in, uh, we are told to substitute external forms of religion for holiness of heart and life is still as pleasing to the unrenewed nature as it was in the days of the Jewish teachers. Today, as then, there are false spiritual guides to whose doctrines many listen eagerly. It is certain studied effort to divert minds from the hope of salvation through faith in Christ and obedience to the law of God. In every age, the enemy adapts his temptations to the prejudices or inclinations of those whom he is seeking to deceive. It is the duty of every servant of God to withstand family and decidedly this avatars of the faith and by the word of truth fearlessly to expose their errors. And so, live sketches of Paul, page 188, paragraph one, while Paul looked with interest and hope to new fields of labor in the West, he had cause of serious apprehension concerning the fields of his former labor in the past, in the East. Tidings had been received at Corinth from the churches in Galatia, revealing a state of great confusion and even of absolute apostasy. Judaizing teachers were opposing the work of the apostle and seeking to destroy the fruits of his labors. And so um, there is nothing new under the sun. And the same problems that the church faced then are the same problems that uh, we are facing today. How can we be able to tackle the problems that we are having today? Um, I'll read one quote as uh, we close this. And um, I won't be able to project it, but uh, this is uh, early writing. As we close up early writing, page 63.2. How do we tackle the issue of those who are saying that we should keep the feast because First Corinthians 5, 7, and 8 says that we should keep the feast. While we have read some numerous quotes that say, that uh, that uh, typical service was fulfilled in Christ. In early writing, page 63, paragraph one and paragraph two, I read this. I saw the necessity of the messengers, especially watching and checking all fanatism, wherever they might see it arise. Satan is pressing in on every side and unless we watch for him and we have our eyes open to his devices and snares and have on the whole arm of God, the fiery darts of the wicked will hit us. Therefore, are many precious truth, there are many precious truths contained in the word of God, but it is the present truth that the flock needs to know now. I've seen the danger of the messengers running off from the important points of the present truth to dwell upon subjects that are not calculated to unite the flock and sanctify the soul. Saturn here take every possible advantage to injure the cause. But such a subject as the sanctuary in connection with the 2300 days, the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus are perfectly calculated to explain the past Advent movement and show what our present position is, establish the faith of the doubting and give certainty to the glorious future. This I have frequently seen were the principal subjects on which the messengers should dwell. And so in this time where there is uh, much apostasy and much holding onto the formal religion, I pray that um, may the Lord find a people who are ready to accept Christ as the fulfillment of these things, accept him as our propitiation and uh, be able to accord the merits of his blood upon their lives and live a life worthy the calling. Otherwise, may the Lord bless us and uh, may we continue reading and loving each other. May we continue, stud uh, continue studying so that uh, 
we may not be found wanting in the balances of the sanctuary. Above all, uh, let us make sure that um, we are clinging on Christ, nothing to come between us and Christ, nothing to separate us between uh, our Lord and our Savior. And so uh, with those words, may the Lord bless us and may he keep us. Let us uh, close with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, again, we say just thank you for everything. That which we do not understand, Lord, make it plain upon our hearts that uh, we may not err from the true way. And so help us to love one another deeply and above all, seek to help others which are in darkness. For we know as we seek to help others, we are just helping ourselves. Slay every selfishness in our hearts that we may serve thee in uh, a new way, in a new life with the sincerity of the truth, putting away malice and wickedness and so that we may have unleavened bread in us, living in us and for us and working in us. May your joy uh, be in our hearts and uh, renew the joy of salvation in our hearts. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.